Welcome everybody, my name is Jan Dawson, I'm the Bishop of the Highland 16th Ward right over here, of which John and, and Tricia and Eric and their family have been members. Uh, I've been asked to conduct today uh, these services to remember John Harrison Stallings. Thank you for being here to uh, remember John and his life. We're grateful to have known him and grateful to have the opportunity to celebrate his life and to, to remember him today. Um, we thank Sister Ellen Hamatangelo, who is playing the uh, music for us today. We're grateful to have her with her and, and her wonderful talents. Um, and our chorus today will be Amber Prusi. Um, we'll start today by singing our opening hymn, The Spirit of God, which is number two in the hymn book, if you have a hymn book, and I think that's sheet music as well. And then the invocation will be offered by David Prusi.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this day. We're grateful for the opportunity which we have to be gathered here as friends and family to remember uh, John Stallings, uh, our grandpa, our father, um, our spouse, our friend, uh, and the man that he was in our lives. We're grateful for the opportunity which we have to be here to remember um, all the different ways that he has helped us and been there in our lives. And we're grateful for the sun which is shining outside and for the opportunity which we have to be gathered and that everyone was able to make it safely. Please help us to remember the spirit which we feel and know of thy love for each and every one of us, and especially for uh, Grandpa John as he is now passed on, that he is able to be with thee once again and be able to see his family which he hasn't seen for a long time. We're again grateful for all the many blessings which we see each and every day. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the music and for that beautiful prayer. Um, we'll next have uh, the family story which John himself put together, which will be read by Adam Prusi. Uh, we'll have a tribute video slideshow. And then we'll have John's testimony, which will be read by Karen Prusi. Uh, following that, we'll have a musical selection, A Few Good Highs of Cola, which will be performed by Alan and Atangela. We'll, we'll go to that point. Um, hi, just so everybody knows that this, this was written by him, but I've kind of taken it and put the pieces together, so it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Um, but both Carrie and I will be reading as he wrote. Um, so he, my grandpa had a passion for genealogy and sharing stories of people that brought him to where he is. And so he had wanted to share those stories with you. Um, he had, a, there was a quote, so President James J. Christman at Dayton, Ohio East State Conference in November 2005 asked that we write down how we got to the point where we are in the gospel. And so that is how I'm sharing these stories. So Tom Berry was born in Missouri in September, September 29, 1872, and made the run into Oklahoma Territory in 1889 at the age of 17 in conjunction with his father and uncle who had in about 1880 ca cattle ranch on a land east from Indian nations. The Berry Brothers Ranch, uh, which covered six townships of land, but was quite small compared to other ranches east in the Cherokee Strip. All leases with the Indians were canceled as the federal government divided up the land into 160-acre farm sites prior to the time of the 1889 run. The TMB Ranch is still held by Thomas and & Berry and & Co. and is under active cultivation. Um, grandfather moved the family to independence during the First World War in 1916 to 1918 and go back to Payne County to run the ranch. Um, Harriet V. was baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on the 9th of June, 1934, and Thomas N. Berry was baptized the 24th of March, 1935, and they were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple on the 3rd of October, 1935. His grandmother and grandfather Berry were sealed in the Salt Lake Temple in 1935. His mother, Ruby Berry Stallings, was baptized the 3rd of January, in 1937, along with his sister Virginia Stallings, by Bill Berry. Dora Berry Snow was baptized on the 11th of August, 1939. His father, Harry Coburn Stallings, married Ruby Isabel Berry on April 4, 1925, in Stillwater, Oklahoma, in her parents' home in Stillwater. Their three children were Harry Coburn Jr., born in El Reno, Canadian County, Oklahoma, on December 31, 1925. To Virginia Bronin Woodward, Woodward County, Oklahoma, October 22nd, 1927, married to Earl J. Hampton. She is the mother of six children, David, Virginia, Deborah, Pamela, Tom, and Lisa. Then the third child, which is John Harrison, born in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma County, Oklahoma, on July 1st, 1940, that's my grandpa, to Claudia Lynette Harvey, who was born 20, 28. They got married the 28th of December, 1963 and father of Sherry L. Tracy, Sherry L., Trisha, John B., Tracy, and Claudia John. 
So five generations of LDS members have proceeded from Thomas N. and Harriet B. Berry, who helped build the first LDS chapel in Oklahoma.
together by my Aunt Claudia, which was John's um, youngest daughter. Um, like Adam said, uh, Grandpa left a long life sketch that he wanted to at his funeral. Um, my brother Adam covered more of the life or the family history, and I'm going to be covering more of Grandpa's testimony of the gospel. Um, so I will be reading this as he wrote it. Um, so Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in October 1999 General Conference gave a talk entitled, A Year of the Jubilee. In this talk, Elder Perry asked that we preserve for our children the stories of how the gospel was brought to and accepted by early members of our families. Mother said Papa was an avid student of the Bible and could quote large portions from memory. She said Papa's favorite scripture was from Matthew 6, 19-34, especially starting with verse 25 to 34. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one more cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The scripture is from the Sermon on the Mount. Also from the Sermon on the Mount is the scripture which Mother mentioned Pa as liking is Matthew 5:44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I was raised in the church and baptized and confirmed on December 3rd, 1950, after the first chapel was dedicated in Oklahoma City at 44th and North Lee Streets. While being counseled by the bishop in my ward in Ohio, he challenged me to read the Book of Mormon daily, which I have tried diligently to do, and it has increased my testimony in Jesus Christ and his atonement for us. One year in Sunday school, we were studying the Doctrine and Covenants, and we were asked to read Joseph Smith 1, which tells about the first vision and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. I read these words of the Prophet Joseph, and then felt inspired to pray for an understanding. The still small voice filled me with a testimony of their truthfulness. This is how Alma received a testimony, and how we all receive a testimony. I want you to know my testimony of their truthfulness, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been restored in its fullness in these last days. Um, and then I would just like to add my own testimony. Um, I'm very grateful for the ancestors who went before me and for their diligence in the gospel and bringing the gospel into my life. Um, I'm grateful to have a savior who loves me and who overcame death for us so that I know we can live together again and that we will see our grandfather again. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
you for that. That's wonderful. Um, we'll now have uh, some time for those. We I know that a number of people have prepared things ahead of time to share during this time. So we'll have those people come forward one by one and share those things that they've prepared. And then there'll be time for anybody else who wishes to share something about John and his life. Uh, and we'll just allow time for that. And uh, at the end of that, I'll come back up and give some closing remarks. Became our neighbors who lived near to us in the Ramblewood edition. His children attended Deer Creek School with my children. When I was young, my family lived in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and my cousin John lived in Oklahoma City. His mother and mine were sisters. When I was in high school, my family oh sorry. When I was in high school, my family moved to Oklahoma City. Then I saw John more often. One year, cousin John needed to drive his car to BYU and Aunt Ruby did not want him to go on this long trip alone. She and my mother decided to have me and my friend, Deanne, accompany him on the long 20-hour drive to Utah in his car. We even stopped for the night on this trip. John was always shy, but he, uh, but he did have a funny sense of humor. I think he was a good sport to travel with his 15-year-old cousin and her friend. We giggled a lot and teased him, and that he would turn bright red. Making the trip more interesting, we even visited uh, the Royal Gorge in Colorado to sightsee. When we got to the BYU campus in Provo, John showed us around. Later, he even took us to Salt Lake City to see the Temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the beautiful grounds. When we arrived, uh, standing near the Temple Gate, I was very surprised to see many people carrying protest signs against the church. In those times, anti-Mormons would stand outside of the temple grounds and say that Mormons were evil and call them other derogatory words. While I was looking at these protesters, I must have rubbed my eye and my heart contact lens flipped out of it. Been there, done that. <laughs> Without my contact, I couldn't see anything at all. Trying to find it, we got down on our hands and knees on the sidewalk of the Salt Lake Temple hunting for it. It was a humiliating and embarrassing predicament for us teenagers. Between the three of us crawling around on the concrete and grass, we were able to find it. As a team, we found it, and I believe that was a miracle. John endured it all. John took Dee and I on a grand adventure. Looking back, I can't even imagine having a college-age boy, young cousin, and friend travel across the country on such a grand trip. Remembering this adventure has brought me fond memories and smiles through the years. As an adult, John moved his family to be closer to his mother in Oklahoma. He put his children in the Deer Creek school system, the same system my children attended. We had many school interactions. Additionally, I specifically remember that Patricia was in my Miami class at church. We had so much fun. I loved being with the girls. I remember the class even tried to make a movie with our phones. At the time, technically, it was mostly impossible, but we had fun creating. The girls wrote the play themselves. I'm sure it was not good at all, but we had lots of laughs and enjoyed each other's friendship. Sherry, Patricia, Tracy, John, and Claudia were always busy, but included in our life. After John moved his family back to Utah, we did not see all of them. John would come to the Stillwater meetings of the Thomas & Berry Company that I also attended. He was usually accompanied by his daughter, Tracy. Later, he became the treasurer. I would get to visit with him at our regular company meetings. We both shared the love of family history. We would eat lunch and catch up on genealogy stories and current family happenings. And that was the grand adventure. 
Um, and since I'm up here, some of the things I always remember is that like family was really important to Grandpa. Um, he would always be doing genealogy and would always want to share stories. Uh, and it was always very interesting to hear about his family. And he, you know, he spent loads of time and hours getting pictures all into uh, family search. And then he was, the minute he found something new, he was always wanting to show us when we'd come visit. And that was always exciting. Um, something also with my family in particular is uh, if you've read the back of the program um, where it talks about him being big into gardening, that was a big thing where he, like, we would get random uh, bulbs and different flowers to plant in our yard because he knew that Amber was, uh, that's my wife back in the corner, um, was big into gardening and, and, and uh, growing flowers. And, and there's, I can't remember the name of the plant, but there's this one plant that we like, killed off three times. And uh, every time he found out, we'd get a new one in the mail shortly later to try and go again. And I don't think it ever survived. Yeah, so we did not have that green thumb with that plant, but he was always sure to make sure that we had another one that we could try. So those are just some of the memories that I have of him. So. Um, 
There was another time when he had this, when it, the serious decline happened, our son had just decided to move, our son and his wife had decided to move from Oregon to Utah, and it was the same week we ended up taking him to the hospital, and if he hadn't been there, I don't know how we would, even would have gotten him there. And then it became all hands on deck, and if it hadn't been all four of us taking care of him, we would, we would not have been able to do it and keep him in our home as long as we did. So I just feel like there were so many miracles that surrounded his caretaking, and I feel like um, those are some of the things he would want us to remember, that God loves everybody, every one of us, and he's always looking out for us. And, um, and I'm really grateful to have been able to be able to see that in our life. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am going to tell you a story that involves Tracy and John. Today, in celebration of John Stallings, I'd like to tell you a story about John's hunt for the perfect hat. Now, John came to see Tracy and I three or four times a year, and he would stay between a week and two every time. We had an antique fedora that hung on the wall. And we would ask John what he would want to do when he came to visit us. And he would say, whatever he wanted to do, go to the gardens, the library, to the historical society, wherever it may be, museums. And on the way to wherever those were, we always had to stop at some little store, a haberdashery, or a Western outfitter, Whatever little shop was near, it didn't matter. We drove from, and for those that don't know Oklahoma, Heavener, Oklahoma in the southeast corner to Woodward, Oklahoma in the northwest corner and Tulsa in the north east corner and over to the southwest corner. And every one of those little places we had to stop, we would always find a store or two that we had to go in in order for John to find his perfect hat. <laughs> I've lost my place. <laughs> no shelf off of that, no hat off of the shelf would ever fit properly. The pre-made ones were never the right fit, never the right material, or never the right type and it needed to be from Oklahoma. John admired that antique fedora on the wall every time he came. It was if he was hoping that one day that antique fedora would fit his head. John finally admitted, well, we asked him, do you like that hat, John? Because after years, and I literally mean years, of traveling every freaking little tiny store, Love the man dear is going to tell you this, but after a while, you kind of go, I don't know what you're looking for. <laughs> we asked him, John, do you like that hat? And he said, John finally admitted that his dad had a hat that was similar and that he wore it every day. And John said, I really want to have exactly like my father's. Thus began the search for both high and low for a hat maker so we could get John the hat. Finally, Tracy and I located a custom hat maker in a small town in Noble, Oklahoma that was literally 15 minutes from our house. <laughs> wow. Exactly. <laughs> we scheduled an appointment for John H. to meet Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Schaefer's hat. Mr. Schaefer and John spoke for at least two hours about hats and history of Oklahoma and all the celebrities that Mr. Schaefer had made hats for. Custom hats, no less. Eventually, they got down to business. Mr. Schaefer took the measurements of John H.'s and John H. chose the material and the style that he wanted and the hat was scheduled to be completed in about three months from that date. When the hat was ready, John H. came back to town 
we drove out to Noblewood, and once again, we spent at least two hours while John H. and Mr. Schaefer talked about Acts in Oklahoma. <laughs> the very two subjects that they were both very passionate about. And after a very thorough history of hat discussions, John H. tried on his new hat. The bespoke hat was a perfect fit, and John H. was so thrilled that he finally had, had a hat like his father's. John H. wore that hat every day for the rest of the stay with us. He saw the hat in the... Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening. <laughs> you have to admit it was humorous. So I'm not sure what I'm going to say. I didn't prepare anything because that was too emotional. So if there's any emotional, go with me now. Um, but I know I'll regret it. If I don't get up and say something. And if, if I do say something, it's going to be random stuff. Because first of all, I don't have a very good memory. So it's just going to be random thoughts because that's all I have. Um, I just remember, if I, you know, I might jump around, because, you know, um, but I remember him going to the summer camps with me, even though sometimes I didn't want him to. <laughs> um, but, you know, he was always there for me. Um, there was one particular time when we went on a, a canoe trip on the Snake River, I think it was. And we ended up capsizing it. And um, it, we were in the community together, and he lost his glasses, and I almost drowned. Well, maybe not, but <laughs> I don't know. But he took it that way. And the next, you know, Sunday, he was, he didn't have his glasses because he lost them, and he, he can't see without those. Even at that time, um, he got up and for his testimony, which he didn't do very often. And then later on, after we moved to uh, Farmington, things were kind of rough there. He would go and he would take me to the comic book stores. And, well, I looked at the comic books, of course, he would go to the used books. Look at those. So it wasn't all like him just bringing me to the comic book stores. Cause or something in there for him too. Um, but of course he would buy me something. Because he would always buy you something. He would get the used book and then he would buy you something really nice. You know, he would have their really bad shoes and then he would buy you some really expensive shoes. Because that's the sort of person he was. And then also in Farmington, he would take me to the, and back then, the Star Trek conventions. Um, well, they were Star Trek and sci-fi. One Star Trek convention in particular, I think, was, um, they were small. It was like maybe 15 people there. Um, and we had, like, a woman ran there. She was old at the time. And this was, like, 88, like, so late 80s. But, oh, by then, because this, you know, the 60s show. But, um, he, he liked that. And then um, there was one we went to that uh, Major Barrett, you know, Bruce Chapel was there. We enjoyed that together. Um, and I remember this is going back way, way. This is back when we lived in um, um, Oklahoma City before we ever moved to Idaho. Um, I remember one Easter we went out. Um, I think in, in this particular Easter, I don't know if mom or dad did it, but we had our Easter baskets were like, I don't know what happened to the Easter baskets themselves, but it was like these silver metal bowls that the Easter baskets ended up eating with grass in them, and the, with the candy. And it was cute, but they weren't Easter baskets. I mean, they were, you know, makeshift Easter baskets. <laughs> 
And then the, the part about him, though, was when we went out in the yard and we looked at the flowers. And there was a little pennies with the, you know, just, you know, starting to bloom because it's, you know, early spring. Um, with, you know, the ants crawling on them and stuff. But I'm trying to think if I can think of anything else. But I just want everybody to know that I really appreciate him. And I wish that I had been able to visit him after I moved to uh, Florida with my family. And he did come and visit us. Um, last time we were able to visit him was in 2011 when I was, when I was sick. Um, but he came and visited with my family. I think in the slideshow you saw a little of them. They look a lot different now because that's been 13 years. So it's been 13 years since I saw them. But I just wanted to get up and say a few words. So I think I may have always been the villain in John's life, because I think I stole his daughter from him. <laughs> um, but it didn't take long after we were married for me to realize um, how important family was to him. He, people have already mentioned how much he loved genealogy, but he also went out of his way to make sure that he could come and be at important events in our family's lives. Um, he was there for every ordination, and I think the I think what made him the most proud was when our three sons each earned their eagle scout, and he got to sit in the eagle's nest, which was something that neither me nor my dad got to do because neither one of us ever earned our eagle. But he, John, had earned his eagle scout, and he was very proud of that fact that he had done all of that. Um, we have an article at home that was published in their local paper when he earned his Eagle Scout, and he was very proud of that moment. And it meant a lot to him when his grandsons were able to follow in his footsteps in that way. Um, another thing I remember about him after he came to live with us, um, for those of you who might not know, I'm kind of a geek. I record Jeopardy and watch. <laughs> recorded episodes of Jeopardy. And um, so usually I'd watch it right after dinner. And so he, um, while I'm watching Jeopardy, he is doing whatever he was doing, you know, kind of working his way back and forth from the kitchen to his, his bedroom and stuff. But um, he was always, even, you know, when he was 79, 80, when he first started, when he was first living with us before he started to deteriorate, he would, you know, pop off with answers. He knew answers about all sorts of different topics, even things you you wouldn't think he'd have any idea about. He would be able to pop off the answer, and, and uh, that was just something that I remember about him in his while he was living with us. That was kind of funny. He'd always he was always willing to talk about BYU football or Oklahoma and Oklahoma State football. Uh, which was kind of nice after, you know, all of my sons had moved out and all I had were women in the house with me. Uh, it was kind of nice to have somebody else who actually knew what a touchdown was, <laughs> an extra point. Um, Carrie's laughing because she now has a boyfriend that makes her learn all of that stuff. So. Um, but it was... It was a really humbling experience to, to spend the last few years of his life with him. Um, we didn't necessarily get to go do all the fun things that you saw him doing in the video with some of his other uh, um, children. Uh, but we did still, um, you know, we, we had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. We have family dinners on every, every Sunday and he was, he was there participating. And, and it gave him a chance to get to know his grandchildren. Because growing up, or as my children were growing up, he, he never lived in Utah. 
He was always living someplace else, but he took the time in his, out of his life to come and to, you know, visit and on those special occasions. And then, you know, when he finally did move in with us, that was really the chance for my kids to really get to know him and to interact with him more than they did uh, when they were younger. And I appreciate that they had that opportunity. And I say these things to me, Jesus Christ, amen. Okay, so this is a little bit weird, but whenever um, me and my brother would sleep over, um, like whenever, like whatever meal, whenever he came out, he would always have a random picture up to show us. Like it could have been like his dad, it could have been like an airplane, some, it just something random. He would just bring up something random. <laughs> it was so funny. And that's really the one of the only memories I have of him. So I'm really grateful that he was had that sense of humor and would show us these really they were actually really cool pictures. And I'm just really grateful that I was able to meet him in my lifetime, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Since he has passed, 
I have felt him, and we have talked, and we are both sealed in the, we were sealed in the temple, and I honor my temple covenants with him, and I hope and pray that we can be together in eternities. We both prayed together when he was staying at our house when he was sick for a while. We prayed each night. We um, read scriptures together, and it was a specialist experience. But John loved the church. He was a basketball uh, coach at one time. He was really, and he was a scout leader at one time. I don't think that was put on his obituary. I don't know. But, um, and we moved several places. He had to travel a lot. But I just want you to know he was a good man and a good father. And I miss him with all my heart and soul. And I want my grandchildren to know I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know Heavenly Father lives. I know Jesus Christ lives. I talk to him every night. They are with me. They are helping me. I could have been taken three times from this earth, and I don't want to make this about me because it's about John and his life. But the Lord has wanted me to go home for three times, and I have told him no. I have agreed at a time and date when I will go back, but I want to be with my family. And it is a wonderful miracle that my all five children are here. And it's been beautiful working with them, putting this, this funeral together. And I appreciate them and I love them with all my heart and soul. And he loved them. And when he was in the nursing home in Nephi, he couldn't talk to me, but I would call him, and then when Trisha got there, she would hand him the phone so he could hear what I was saying. And the last time I did talk to him, it was very, very hard, but I know he said, I love you. And that meant everything in the world to me. And I want you kids to know that he made mistakes, I made mistakes. We both kneeled down together, and he fell off the bed so we, um, when he was sick. And so I kneeled down by him, and we said a prayer. And he told how much he loved his family. And to me, that was special. But he wants his family in the eternities. He wants them to love the Lord. He wants them to love the gospel. And as I say, John, John and I made our mistakes in our marriage, but we did forgive each other. And that is the most important. And the important thing I want to say now is I have said some things in my life about John that I should have never told people that wasn't a good side of him but I've got a bad side. But I want you to know, you never, ever, ever talk about people. Once you talk about people, when you see John suffering the way he did, you have learned, I have learned, that you don't want to see anybody suffer like that. And I have prayed and prayed night after night to be forgiven of all my sins and anything I've ever said wrong about John, because I have my mistakes too. And I hope and pray that his family will accept him and that he will be happy. And there's one other thing I want to say about him. When I met married him, his brother, Harry Jr., and he would sit at the table and literally read the encyclopedia from cover to cover. They would read the dictionary. They were so knowledgeable. And John was very knowledgeable in the church. And John and I served two missions together, um, and one in Farmington, Utah, and one in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I just want you to know that I will be with him in the eternities 
and we've committed to that, and we want our family there, all of you. So, all, all of us are good people, we just have to work and strive, and the first thing you know and get to know is there is a Father in heaven, there is a Jesus Christ, and they will talk to you, and they are there, they will, some nights, they just hold your hand and you can feel it. So I want you to know, I have a testimony. John had a beautiful testimony. And he, you should be very proud of a grandpa that we kneeled and forgave each other and we repented with Heavenly Father and that's all that matters in this life. And I'm sorry I took this time but I love all of you. I love my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren equally, and I always will. And just know when it's time to go, I will tell you, because I have told Heavenly Father I will come back at a certain time, and please let me go. And I'll tell you at the time, but anyway. And I love all of you, and I'm appreciative my sister is here. And I say these things in our Father's name in, and in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody else who'd like to share something before we finish? Okay. Well, thank you so much to all of those who, who shared memories and who shared things that John had written during his life as well. We're grateful for that. I'll close here with some brief remarks. I, as I was thinking and praying about this and this opportunity to speak, um, I was thinking back to last weekend when we had the general conference of our church and. Um, one of the wonderful hymns that was sung by one of the choirs there is one we don't hear very often, but which our choirs have sung before during these events, which is called Softly and Tenderly. Um, and that's what came to mind, and so I went and looked up the lyrics, and it feels particularly appropriate for, for this moment. And, and these are the, the lyrics of the first verse in the chorus. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. And I think that's true for all of us at every moment in our life, that he's always calling us uh, earnestly, softly, tenderly, as it says in those words. But it seems at this time as if he has called John home to him. Um, and I know John was weary towards the end with all of the physical ailments that he had. Um, and as it says there, ye who are weary, come home. And I think he'd reached that point in his life with the, with the way that his body was deteriorating physically. Um, even though until quite late on, his mind was very sharp. And, and as we got to know him as he moved into the ward here, it was great to get to know him and see that intellect. And, and John, our Elders Quorum president, who's here, was talking about how during COVID, we were having these online Elders Quorum lessons and how he would always pipe up and chime in and, and say things and contribute there. Um, and so it was wonderful to get to know him in that way during the time that he was in our ward. Um, but I feel confident that the Saviour has called him home now. And I have no doubt from everything that I've heard today that there are many others in his family who are calling him home and waiting for him and, and earnestly awaiting him to, to come home to them as well and to be with them and to be reunited with him. Um, the, the song goes on, Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. None of us is perfect, right? We all need that, that pardon, that forgiveness as well. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner, come home. And again, he calls for each of us to come home to him as well. And uh, I'm grateful for the knowledge that we have of the Saviour. I'm grateful that at moments like this, that we can have hope, that we can have peace, that we can have comfort. Um, but we will see our loved ones again. 
um, that we will see John again specifically, uh, that the time will come that we will be able to be reunited with him and, uh, and share the, the love and relationships that we had here on this earth. And I, I believe that to be true, and I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll close today by singing the hymn, God be with you till we meet again. That's number 152 in the hymn book. And then the benediction will be given by Trisha Prusi. Um, following that, um, we will have the interment here at the Highland City Cemetery, right behind the mortuary here. And the dedication of the grave there will be done by Eric Prusi.
Our casket bearers will have you just step out and line up on either side of the doors here. Cemetery. You can reach uh, the tent is visible just out here, but you'll go out and around into the cemetery. 